Welcome to our Community Candidate Forum. This event is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of East Multnomah County, Media East, the Coalition of Gresham Neighborhood Associations, and the American Association of University Women, the Gresham Area Branch. It's my pleasure to serve as your moderator this evening. I'm a League member. My name is Deb Frick. The ground rules are simple. The League has presented me with questions to ask each candidate, the same questions. No one has seen these questions. In fact, I only saw them yesterday, so they're top secret. <laughs> the candidates are here without any prepared notes. If they need to take notes, the League has provided them with, with necessary writing implements. Do you have some paper and something to write with? Great. And we will be timing their responses. We have our timekeepers here. And we will let our candidates know when they have 30 seconds left and um, 15 seconds, I guess, and then when their time is up. And we will try to enforce that. We'll begin our, our candidate forum with opening statements from each candidate. And then we will close the evening, this session, with closing statements. In between all of this, if there's extra time, we will ask questions that have been submitted from audience members to the League members in the room. We hope that we have time for that. If not, we will try to stay on time. So let us begin. Okay? Okay. Let us begin with two-minute timed opening statements from our candidates and for the sake of ease we'll go alphabetically if that's all right and we'll talk uh, we'll start with Lori Anderson thank you um, I'm very honored to be your state senator I'm Lori Monis Anderson and I deeply care about our community and I want to continue the work that I've started uh, in the 2013 legislative session we need to keep our priorities straight we need to fund public education. We need to keep investing in job creation and continue to fund public safety. I've always put East Multnomah County first. Gresham, Troutdale, Wood Village, and Fairview have to be treated fairly and get what we deserve. I have experience making sure that we have a strong voice in the legislature. As a moderate, and known to be work in a very bipartisan way, I have a proven record with excellent results. We know that a strong, well-educated workforce is a pillar of a strong economy. Funding education is our very first priority. We must reduce class size and stop teacher layoffs so that we can so that our communities can grow and educate our kids. We also must support our community colleges to grow job skills training programs and to continue them uh, and to actually connect them with small businesses in the area. Worker training and career technology are vital for creating jobs in our area. Finally, keeping our streets and community safe has always been a top priority for me. I have supported tough penalties for offenders and sustained funding for the East Metro Gang Enforcement Team. I support the county level sexual assault response teams to help victims of terrible crimes. And I'm a member of the Governor's Domestic Violence Task Force and Multnomah County's Strive Coalition that works on com combating youth violence. My work has been significant, and I would be honored to continue as your state senator. Thank, Thank you. you. Now let us hear from Mr. Hansen. Thank you very much for this opportunity to have this forum, and thanks for having this opportunity to meet with you again, Senator Monis Anderson. Um, we've had a lot of these debates recently, and it's been fun. And she says this is our last one together, so <laughs> it's been fun. And I, I want to congratulate her as well as because it has been a good campaign, I think things have stayed pretty much above the board, and I, I'm proud of that, in fact. Um, sometimes we can't control everything that is said on our behalf or on, on our opponent's detriment, but we've done pretty well. I, I appreciate that fact because this is our community. Um, my wife and I together have nine children. Um, those children are all grown and gone now from the area, and some of them have tried to come back home, but for various reasons, some haven't been able to find jobs, some haven't found the housing opportunities that they wanted, and so they don't live in the state of Oregon. I want to go to Salem 
so that my kids and your kids can live in this beautiful state and particularly in this beautiful area that we call home. I want to go to Salem to take the job experience that I've had over the past 22 years of owning my own business in the city of Gresham to be able to go to Salem with that, that experience, with that knowledge of what it takes to run a business, with the knowledge of what it is to, to have to meet government regulations, to have to work around the red tape that sometimes the government impose upon us, to be able to take that experience for a positive, in a positive way to go to Salem and make a difference for, so that we can get more jobs and more businesses, not only in the state of Oregon, but particularly in East Multnomah County. We need to do things to make it so that job creators want to come to this area. We need to increase our funding for the schools. We need to make sure that we adequately fund our schools because our children truly are our best resource and we need to stop exporting our best resource. I'm committed to go there to make sure that we adequately fund education, that we adequately fund our not only our K through 12 education but also our community colleges and our higher education and also to keep our streets and our environment safe so that our kids will want to be here, will be safe here and also so employers will feel better about locating in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's begin the questions the league has prepared. And uh, Scott, may I call you Scott? Is sure that can. A, all right. But we like to keep it kind of friendly here. Um, Scott, I'd like to ask you the first question since Lori got to go first with her opening statement. And with this in mind, what you were just talking about, what do you what do you do to uh, facilitate bipartisan cooperation and problem solving in the Senate? What do you plan on doing? To me, that will be an easy thing. I've always been a, a collaborator. I've always been able to work well with other people, no matter what their political backgrounds, their ideologies, whatever it might be. Um, over the years, I've served on various boards and committees. And as I've served on those boards and committees, almost always I've been asked to serve as the chairman or the president of those boards and committees because I'm, I'm able to work well with other people. I have a desire to make sure that we always listen to other people's opinions. Um, I've done that over my lifetime. In fact, most of the people I've probably served with on various boards and committees have no idea what my political bent might be. I'm there to solve problems, to get things done, to put aside the petty differences that sometimes exist, but to make sure that the number one priority, which is whatever the task is at hand, to make sure that that gets accomplished, whether it be in down in the legislature, job creation, education funding, you know, safety, those kind of things take precedence over my personal views or, my, or the things that I might feel differently than somebody else about. I can guarantee that I'll always vote firstly for my convictions, then my constituents, and then my party, and not the other way around. Senator Frank Morse down in um, Albany, who just um, retired from the Senate, has been my example. He's been some that I've looked up to because of his ability to work across the party aisle, to be a consensus maker, to build bridges across the party aisle. I have no desire to just represent the Republicans because I am a Republican. I want to re represent the people of East County and to represent the people of Oregon who deserve that. Thank you. Lori, what do you think? How will you, uh, what will you do to facilitate bipartisan cooperation and problem solving in the Senate? I have already done that. Uh, I uh, chair the Senate Health Policy Committee and am vice chair uh, with the Republican chair of the Veterans Military Affairs Committee. And uh, my vice chair of my health committee is a Republican. And we work together on the agenda. And I think the results of what we have been able to accomplished through my committee on health care reform, it's historic. We had bipartisan support for our, our health care. Now there are um, a lot of uh, issues that come up where we have the insurance companies fighting the hospitals, fighting the doctors, etc. My the, always how I've done it is get everyone together in a room, the leaders in the room of these ideas and we work out and maybe it's consensus. No one ever gets what they really want, but it's consensus because that is the way our democratic process works. And I'm so excited to be able to go back and continue that because I just have that, as a nurse, a passion for uh, what we've been doing with health care legislation and also what we have been doing for our veterans uh, in making them uh, come back and be able to get back into our community. So that's what I've been doing, and I will continue to do it. All right, that sounds great. Um, now, realizing, though, Lori, okay, that tax reform may be necessary, okay, how can politics be taken out of the reform process? 
again, I will just go back to when you get to tax reform, actually the voters really aren't talking to me about tax reform, they're actually talking to me about making government more accountable and making government more efficient and making um, government transparent. That is key. And our focus on the fiscal issues like auditing and uh, government programs to make sure that uh, they are doing what they're supposed to be doing with our tax dollars is so important, like reducing middle management like um, just taking care of some of the things that are wasteful in, uh, in state government. And, and the same thing is with he healthcare delivery system. Our new healthcare delivery system is going to be saving the state of Oregon millions of dollars and that will free up money for education, for public safety, for human services. So again, it's a collaborative approach but it's looking at what we have, uh, the money, the tax, the revenue that we have and working with that. Thank you. Scott, what do you think? It, it does take working across party lines. You have to work together. Um, as I was mentioned, Senator Morse earlier, he and Senator Burdick from Portland, one a Democrat, one a Republican, worked together for years on a spending and revenue solution to the problems that some people think face the state of Oregon. They realized that they had to work together because no one side could do it on their own. They worked to make it so that we not only looked at the tax issues, but also the spending issues because, you know, generalities, you know, Republicans don't want to raise taxes and Democrats don't want to cut spending. That's kind of what everybody thinks. But without tackling both those problems at the same time together, you're not going to get anything done for the state of Oregon. We need to address those issues and we have to be willing to stand up for our principles. We have to be able to make the tough calls when it comes to to those kind of issues, not just letting um, certain interest groups dictate what happens to the state of Oregon. We need to send politicians to down to Salem who are willing to stand up and take a stand and make a stand and say this is what's best for Oregon. It doesn't matter if it's going to cost me my political career. This is what has to happen and I'm willing to do that. Thank you. Okay, back to Lori. Would you please explain your top three legislative priorities? I think we've heard some of them so far, but if you could kind of recap. And how do you propose to achieve them? Um, number one, public safety, okay? Uh, we'll start with public safety. Uh, that is key in our, when I'm talking to our voters in this district, public safety is so important. And we need to continue sustaining the funding for the East Metro Gang Prevention Program. And we have been, uh, I created that in the mid, um, with the representatives in this area in, in the mid uh, 2000, or 2003, and we need to have that. We also um, need to, that, so public safety is num number one, and we will continue to do that. Number two is public education. That is huge in this, in this area. It has to be our top priority. We have been cutting education uh, because the revenues have just not been coming in. We have been in the deepest recession um, for a very, very, very long time. And we had a $4 billion deficit in 2009 and a $2 billion deficit in, in uh, two, 2011. We've balanced our budgets, but now in 2013, we have to shift our priorities so that it will be focused on public education so that we are not cutting class sizes or cutting teachers layoffs or uh, and we need to make sure that class sizes um, don't continue to rise. Thank you. Scott, what are your top three priorities and um, how do you propose to achieve them? I think right now the state of Oregon is crying for jobs and so that has to be at the top of the list. But how do you do that? I think the, the, one of the first things you have to do is you have to prepare and train a qualified workforce. That means education has to be funded adequately. Without, you know, we, politicians talk about funding education all the time, but since 1997, the state budget has gone up 120%. At that time, in 1997, the percentage of the state budget that was spent on education was 16%. Today, that's down below 10%. So they say they, they value education, they say that's a top priority, but evidently it hasn't been because that's not where their dollars have gone. So we need to make sure that we adequately fund our education system. We need to make sure that at the Mount Hood Community College, you know, what a great resource we have here. We need to continue to foster those relationships between the various um, work 
the companies that are already here to get these training programs to see what the workforce really needs so that we can train the kind of workers that businesses need to locate here to keep going here. So that's the number one thing we need to do. Um, my time's about up, so I don't think I'm going to get to three. I'll just stop right there. <laughs> well, these were ambitious questions. <laughs> the league was really um, trying to get as much as they could from both of you, so I think we've heard uh, really great answers on it. Okay, number four. What kind of support would you suggest to promote and maintain small businesses in Oregon? And Scott, I'm going to throw that to you first. What kind of... What, what kind of support would you suggest to promote and help maintain small businesses in Oregon? Well, like the, most of the small business owners that I know, like myself, um, what they really want is they want an environment where they can, they can thrive. They know their businesses. They know what kind of companies that they have. They know how to make their businesses work. We just need for government to get out of our way and to create the environment that it's, they're free to, to grow, to hire more people, to expand the workforce, to, to build a business so that more people can be paying taxes. Some of the things that we, the government can do is they can make sure that the regulations and the red tapes and the fees and the, the forms that the businesses have to fill out are streamlined, that are condensed so that they're concise, so that pe businesses understand exactly what's expected of them. An ever-changing line is always hard to hit. We need to make it so that they know what's expected of them so that they can continue to grow. We also, in this area, we have a lot of land that's available. You know, we've got some of the best shovel-ready land available in East Multnomah County. We need to make sure that the regulations that control land use are also understandable, reasonable, and don't go over the top so that these businesses can use the land that already is available in this area. Thank you. Lori, what do you think? Um, we have to decrease the barriers that exist for small businesses to obtain grants and funding that we have through the state to expand their businesses as well as if they want to uh, add uh, or have more employees. That's number one. We've been doing that and we need to continue doing that. The other is to make sure that our small businesses uh, have the opportunity to uh, have easier access to apply and get our public works contracts that we have with the state. That, that is critical. And third, I think it's extremely important that we continue funding our community colleges that have skills training programs that c and so that we can connect our, our people who are learning those skills with the small businesses in, in our community. So it's so important to, to make sure that we get um, manufacturing back up and Mount Hood Community College has a wonderful program and we have to continue um, funding that so that the skills that the businesses have can get together with Mount Hood Community College, their programs, and say, these are the skills I need for my business, and then let that happen. Thank you. Okay, next question. Now, this C follows along, so you may, may be able to expand on some of your answers. Um, the League wants to know, how can we make Oregon more attractive to businesses that want an educated and highly trained workforce. So, Lori? Mm -hmm. um, what we did last session was actually uh, increase I I enterprise zones. Uh, so businesses, when they come to this state, they are looking for incentives. And boy, it's a market out there. We were so lucky to get FedEx to come here. And the reason we got there is it was an enterprise zone and it was very, uh, it was a, a nice fit for them. So we have to expand on, on incentives for these big businesses, but they also have to make sure that they're going to hire a certain number of people and those people are going to be then, uh, be, that there should be a, a, a sort of a standard set so that a business just does, doesn't come in and take advantage of the incentives without actually giving back uh, to to the uh, with pet tax revenues to, to our state um, making sure that our lands are shovel ready we only have one industrial uh, land site and we have it in this district um, that's shovel ready with I, th I think it's 200 some acres um, um, that's next to on um, technology up here um, and those are sites that we have to uh, uh, market 
in the marketplace uh, for businesses to come. But we can't forget our small businesses because without small businesses, our economy is not going to recover, and we have to be focusing on incentives for them also. Thank you. Scott, what, what's your take on this? I have a daughter who uh, graduated from Barrow High School. She graduated cum laude in, her, in economics and tried to get a job back here but couldn't get a job in Oregon, so she now lives in North Carolina. She lives in Chapel Hill. And Chapel Hill, as many of you might know, is they call it the Research Triangle, where they've got Duke, North Carolina State, and the University of North Carolina, three good universities located right there. And the reason she was able to get a job there is because all these industries are locating there because they have such a trained workforce. They don't, the businesses don't have to recruit out of state because they've got who they need right in their backyard. Oregon doesn't have anything like that. We need to, in my opinion, we need to really work hard at seeing what we can do about our higher education, about our trades and skill programs that we're producing, about you know, engineering and technology degrees that we're offering. Make sure that we're offering and giving those programs that, you know, funding those programs that really will make a difference to businesses to make them want to locate here. It's so much easier to find an area where you have, you know, safe streets or we have good education and then you want to locate there as opposed to locating there and expecting to change those things around you. So that's the thing that I think that we could do is change the environment in this state by making it so the businesses want to come here because we have the resource that they want. Good workers. Thank you. All right. Do we have any audience questions so far? Well, I have my last question from the league, but um, if we have any, any questions i would appreciate them being forthcoming so while they're answering the last question we'll have another couple for them okay question number six from the league our oregon constitution requires that we provide adequate funding to meet basic needs basic underlined basic needs how would you meet that requirement scott basic needs as in <laughs> In, I guess, operating the state, whatever, you know? Um, well, the thing that we need to do is we need to make priorities. We need to make sure that the things that we call priorities we're actually funding as priorities. Um, going back to the all-funds budget, you know, right now we spend 23% of our all-funds budgets on education. We spend 35% on health and human services. We spend only 5% on corrections and public safety. If we say that our, our priorities are education and public safety, First, then why doesn't the budget reflect what we say our priorities are? We need to go back and look at what our priorities are. Every, you know, as a, as a civilization, as a community, we need to make sure that we always have the funds adequate to make sure that those who truly have needs are met. You know, it would be sad if we lived in a, in a place where we couldn't help those who truly needed the help of society, needed the help of their neighbors and friends. The state has an obligation to meet those. But Sometimes we go overboard when we fund programs for various different special interests and we forget about the mission of the state, which is really to fund, you know, make sure we have safe streets, safe neighborhoods, and make sure our children and our, our students are educated adequately so that we can raise the, the economy, we can provide those jobs that will increase our tax revenues so we can fund the other things that might not be as high a priority as those two things should and ought to be. Thank you. Lori, what, what do you think? Um, it is so important that the basic needs of food and health care and a home over their head are met for our most vulnerable. And it is in our Constitution that we must take care of our most vulnerable, and that includes our disabled. And so we do a pretty good job of it, but not adequate enough. We are looking at how our, our um, young children are coming into school unable to know their letters or, or numbers. And they have to, after they get out of first grade, be able to read. That's what I want. And so if we start, and we are looking at, um, the governor has proposed a new program to look at those basic needs of our young children before they get into school. And we, we have a lot of diverse programs taking care of that. We are going to make a coordinated effort to bring those programs together, it will be more efficient, will be more transparent, and will be more accountable. And that is going to be one issue that we can address to meet the basic needs of our children, our young children uh, in this state. 
Thank you. Now, I've got a couple of questions from the audience, and one has a little narrative kind of to set this, the tone here. And so it goes like this. I'll try to read it uh, appropriately. I see my neighbors losing their jobs, and a few are having to train others to do their jobs overseas. Yet some mayors locally are talking about lifting the cap on property taxes. So what is your feeling about more taxes well, wages are not going up, and there are people who don't have jobs. Lori, what do you think? Again, I will go back to what I said before on uh, tax reform. Um, the people here don't want to talk about tax reform. They want to talk about government becoming more accountable, government becoming more transparent, and government make, uh, making sure that we are not wasting the money that we have in government. And again, I will go back to what we have been doing with health care. It is going to save in the long run billions of dollars. It's going to free up money so that we can put more money into our ed educational system, into our public safety, and into our, our health care. So uh, reducing middle management, which is what we have done in, in the past, uh, as well as um, um, making sure that, uh, I'll, I will leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Scott, what do you think? It is tough when people are losing jobs. And when you don't have a job, when you don't have an income, when it comes time to pay those property taxes, to pay any tax, it's tough to do. Um, the best thing we can do for those people is to create an environment where we produce more job creators, where we have businesses come to this area to give those people jobs because more than a handout, those people want help. They want to be able to find a good job. And government sometimes can help in those areas, but we still have to have government services. We can't just say, you know, we're going to cut all the taxes, we're going to cut the revenues out because we can't afford to pay the taxes, because where would we be? You know, some of the cities, you know, every city has the different tax rate, and, and we do have to look at how the city's services are funded. Um, for example, in this area, you know, because the tax rate might be lower than other large cities, the city of Gresham in particular has a, one of the lowest tax rates of all large cities in the state of Oregon, which makes it so that they, in order to get their revenue streams, they have to go to different fees. They have to f pick out certain groups of people and f charge them fees to produce the revenue that they need to produce the services that we as citizens want. The state has, has an opportunity and an obligation, I think, to look at how cities are funded so that we can make it a level playing field for all of us, so that we don't just start having fees added upon fees, because even though our tax rates might not be as high as other places, our fee structure has gone out of whack, and we actually are paying more in fees sometimes, it seems like, than we are in taxes. Thank you. Okay, so let's, let's now this is the big white elephant, you know, the elephant in the room. Um, how do you feel, and uh, Laurie, I'm going to throw this one to you uh, first. How do you feel about the Grange coming to um, East County? <laughs> uh, you know? I'm a nurse. Yes. And public safety is very important to me. Uh, they make a big deal about the jobs. And so when this came uh, in front of us uh, a few years ago, I was the one who put the legislation through my own personal bill to make sure that each local city, wherever the casino may locate itself, would have to vote to see if they really wanted it located there. It is the people's choice. But I am worried about public safety and crime. I am worried about addictions. Thank you. Scott? The people in Wood Village and, and Fairview voted a few years ago that they didn't want it in their, in their neighborhood. Um, I don't think anything's changed. And so I support those voters who've actually already made the decision. It's interesting to me that we have a ballot measure on the ballot today that says that we're going to locate a specific business in a specific neighborhood and we're going to let everybody in the state of Oregon vote on it. Um, I would like to see us put that same ballot measure on the ballot and say, let's, let's put it in the home of the people who are proposing this. Let's put it in Lake Oswego <laughs> and see how they like it. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Well, those are all the questions that we have, and we're now ready for your closing statements. So um, since Lori went first, uh, Scott, we'll just let, let you go first for your closing statement. You'll have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity. <coughs> I have a passion for service. My father um, served on the city council in Gresham years ago, and I don't know if it was genetics or what it was, but I've always had a desire to serve and to give back to my community. 
my wife keeps asking me, why are you working so hard to take a cut and pay? Why do you really want to do this? And I can't give a good reason other than the fact that I do want to serve. I want to be a part of the solution. People have kept approached me and said, you know, Scott, you've got a good head on your shoulders. Why don't you step up and do this? And finally, after um, years of talking about it, joking about it with my wife, once the kids were all grown and gone, um, now that I have time to do it, I'm not coaching soccer, I'm not doing the things that as, fa as a father I didn't have time to do this. Now I have the time and I have the passion to go down and make a difference. I have the desire to work with other people, to be a collaborative, to work, to build bridges, to make sure that we turn this state into the state that we all love and know. We, both Lori and I, we love this state. We, this is our home and we have a desire to make it better, but I have the skill set. We need to, I, you know, years ago I voted for term limits. Maybe some of you did as well. Um, the Supreme Court of Oregon threw that out. Now the only way to get a change in government is to run against the incumbents. And so I'm not afraid to do that. I have great respect for my opponent, but we don't always agree on everything, and that's okay. That's what makes a democracy great, the ability to make choices, to choose one person over another. And I think that I have the skills, the desire, the passion, the time, and the effort, and the energy to go down to Salem and to make a difference for Oregon, and particularly for East Multnomah County. Thank you, Scott. Lori, you have the last word. Thank you so much, uh, League of Women Voters, for having this forum. I think it's extremely important for the public to get to hear the views of the people that they're going to vote for, so thank you again. Um, I am very, I would not be wanting to go back to Salem unless I knew I was being effective. And I have been very effective, and my record shows it. Look at the historic changes that we are making in, uh, uh, he in health care. That is key. And I am uh, transforming education is also going to be a key, and we're just in the midst of doing that. Transforming education and health care is absolutely essential to our long-term economy recovery. It's essential to building our workforce in the 21st century, and it's essential to raising our per capita income up uh, to the national average again. I love this community. I am a Gresham High grad. My kids are Gresham High grads, and my parents lived here. And I know what our community is. I know what it was like in the 50s. I know the changes that we have made now. And I so believe that we need to get what we deserve. And I am a very vocal champion of the needs of East Multnomah County. I'm committed to making our community safe. I'm committed to creating creating jobs, I'm committed to fighting for funds for education, and protecting Oregon's most vulnerable citizens. And I would be absolutely honored if you would send me back to Salem again. Thank you. And this uh, concludes our first candidate forum. Thank you so much. Let's get them all a round of applause. Thank you so much.